Um, can you listen again? Test, test, sound test, check. Hello? One last guy? Huh? Okay, okay then. Great. Okay, I forgot the name again. Yeah, to start, I think. Hey, um, here's um, Rasmus Jensen. Anders. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and uh, he's um, going to give a talk about um, unarchitecture and um, scuttlebutt. Yeah. Applause, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming to the talk. So this is going to be about an architecture and um, just a quick introduction. So this is my name. Uh, I did a master's in computer science from the Aalborg University in 2006. And I've been working on this secure scuttlebutt uh, project for the last two, three years. And just a bit of a fair warning, this is going to be a bit opinionated, this talk. So there's going to be both technical things and also like uh, uh, more of a uh, uh, more of a different kind as well, but don't worry, there are going to be plenty of technical things as well. Um, so I wanted to start out with a quote, but instead I wanted to show this pigeon instead, because it sort of sums up pretty well what's going on. Yeah, so this is a pretty clever little figure. So what I'm going to speak about more uh, clearly here is application architecture and software. And I'm going to divide it into uh, three uh, key points. So one of them is the infrastructure, meaning the computer that actually runs all this stuff. And the other thing is going to be the data that's going to be sort of part of this. And the second is the view on the data or the user interface, like how can you actually interact with this data. So if you take a traditional architecture, you have uh, nowadays like some server somewhere connected through the internet to uh, uh, different kinds of clients of various kinds. And when you look at the standard architecture, you have um, some features like one of them is that the server can be hacked. It can be down or it can be shut down like Google does a lot. Um, and uh, one of the other things is that data is really often centralized in these systems. It's stored on the servers and that's where it lives. And you have this UI, it tends to be standardized and, and uh, the, the power in the system lies in deciding how you can actually use the system. When you look at this kind of system online, you often get some kind of one size fits all usage or moderation. And when you look at it in, in, in a more of a traditional company settings, it tends to reflect the existing uh, organizational hierarchies that are in uh, the organization. 
Um, so let's switch uh, uh, a bit to, to talk about machine learning. Look at how how happy they all look in this small network. But I'm actually going to talk a bit about more about the dark side of machine learning. Um, so back to the first slide. So this part is going to be talking about the data and the user interface, like how you connect with this data. And when you look at these machine learning recommendation systems, it's like anywhere where there's large quantities of data, like YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, whatever, and Facebook, of course. And even if you're not one of the 2.3 billion people on Facebook, you're probably uh, still there. I mean, a lot of the apps running on your uh, Android phone will connect to Facebook and um, and would tell it which apps you're, log you're, you're now opening. And this actually gives you a, a, a pretty good profile of the person. So let's say you're opening the King James Bible app or the calorie counter or the period tracker for that sake. Um, get a lot of uh, uh, data here. And when you look at the, the user interfaces in these systems, you have these personalized feeds and, uh, and one of the interesting things is that uh, when you look at the U when you look at YouTube and the way the YouTube interface actually works, 70% uh, of the view time on videos are generated from these recommendations algorithms. And you have this self-reinforcing system where you have the data generates the UI, the UI generates the data, da and so on. You get this like loop, uh, which actually tells you how the system can be used. And then there's this really, <laughs> depends on how you look at it, creepy slide. This is from Facebook uh, data science team, 2014, where they look at the data and, and they can sort of say that, well, love happens around here, right? <laughs> so when you look at the features of these kinds of system, you give the power to the data. And this means that you give the power to anyone who can generate or buy the data. And really, when you look at it, this is like black boxes, which are like attack vectors for any kind of uh, people that want to misuse this system, really in the same way as we had proprietary software back in the 90s. So one way of, of, of influencing this system is to buy ads. And most of these big companies now have online repositories where you can actually go in and look at who bought which apps or ads and uh, the people that they're targeting with the ads. So that's at least some kind of transparency in this. But the problem was that, as you can see here, that uh, actually the software is just riddled with bugs, like identical searches returns different results. I mean, <laughs> come on. One of the other problems with this is that uh, it sort of creates this mon almost like money laundering uh, system for bias, meaning that uh, bias is, is the sort of attributes that you have in the system, which is the data that it is trained upon, and it's actually really hard to see what kind of biases you have in these machine learning systems. Another one of the problems is you have these uh, degenerate feedback loop, like you get filter bubbles and echo chambers as well inside these systems, which manifests itself in the, in the way you use the system because it's recommended you videos, for example. So you probably all heard about this Thai AI uh, that was a bot on Twitter, uh, which would look at the data and then actually tr trying to learn. And it took exactly 24 hours to, to turn this bot into like full on Nazi bot. So, <laughs> but I mean, not necessarily all of this is, is bad. I mean, it is a system and the same weaknesses that the system has can also be turned into opportunities. So this is a quote for how Taiwan combats misinformation. So one of the interesting things that, that you can see is that um, the people that want to target them with like propaganda campaign and disinformation actually start testing these in the wild in order to have the most effective spread of their viral content. 
And this means that the Taiwan government can actually go in and look at these signals when they start happening. And what's interesting here is that each of these ministries then has a team which then has like 60 minutes from when a viral post hits to do like an equally or more convincing narrative that they post on the same media as the people trying to, to break these systems work. We have more of a volunteer based which are like the Lithuanian elves, so they also have a lot of Russian trolls that goes in and spreads all kinds of misinformation in news articles and various social media. And Really, it's sort of like resistance fighters for the 21st century, right? Like they say that we don't want to be the propagandist in reverse. We just, you know, want to expose the bullshit. That's a really low key. And really, I mean, we're in Denmark now, and you look at the Danish election, which just happened, uh, and advertisement on TV is illegal by law from these political parties, but advertisement on the inter internet is not regulated. And I mean, it's just... I mean, it's really just ridiculous uh, when, you, when you think about it. Like, what kind of situation or what kind of system do we really want to end up with here? So, when you do look at these uh, machine learning, there are a lot of ethical a uh, questions that quite often they're not like, addressed. Like, what values does the trained algorithm actually embody? Like, is it steady? Like, who determines what these um, values can be? And, and so it actually leaves like a whole question just set aside to whoever runs these algorithms or the engineers that run the algorithms. So in summary, um, you can use machine learning to individualize and it's, it's sort of like a proprietary data and algorithm stack and it's a constant battle for the people that try to, to use this for good as well. Okay. So let's switch again a bit. So now I'm going to talk about a different kind of architecture. And this is a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. And this is where I think it gets a bit more interesting. So one of the ways you can do decentralized systems is in a federated system. So this is like we've known for email for like ages. It's like different actors can run these servers which have different objectives and different kinds of of ideals, and it's also what's used, for example, for Mastodon, which is like a big decentralized um, system. And when you look at some of the features in this, again, you, you can see that the power is, is then again centralized at the servers in the same way as it was before. So in the same way, you can have them hacked and down or shut down, and it ends up being like a benevolent dictator moderation system and of course, compared to like only one system, you get more diversity, you get like local governance as well. You can start up an instance and do your own kind of uh, governance of this. But one of the problems with these kinds of systems is that they have a tendency to, to go towards sort of an e eventual centralization, like you've seen with email and um, Gmail, for example. A different architecture is fully distributed architecture where the uh, computers uh, running the system are, are also running the infrastructure as well. So you can see different kind of systems using this like uh, that and Scuttlebot for example. Um, and when you look at these architectures you have the power is at the edges instead. And this means that you have user control over the infrastructure, the data that runs on them, and the software that you use to interact with the data. So this means that you get bottom-up governance instead uh, of centralized or pseudo-centralized. And then there was a really great article by Ink and Switch, which talks about local-first software. And some of the tenants that they uh, uh, look at in these systems is that they really want systems which are fast, multi-device, can work offline, we can still provide collaboration between the, um, between the, the users of it. You want longevity and privacy, and you also want user control. So one of these local first systems is Scuttlebutt. And this is actually an, a real image of the network. So you can see the red part down here is the old guard of the system, people, the nodes that have been here the most. 
And as you go through different colors, these are newer nodes in the network. And Skullbot is an identity-centered system. So this means that your profile it's, is what is central in the system. It's not your post, for example, like it is in a forum. And I could call it a social network, but it really has a lot of bad connotations. So I'm going to call it a friend network instead. It's really like there's the, the, there are really no gatekeepers in the systems. All the data is stored locally, and you get the user interfaces embodying local values. And the way it works, like these identities, is that you have a scuttlebutt feed, which is your identity. And so these are just messages that you put in. And the first one uh, has a, a pointer back to, to nothing. It has an author field, which is the person who owns this feed. And then you have a hash of the message as well. And then you sign the message, meaning that nobody else could produce this message. And you get like a long chain of these messages, uh, one for each of these uh, feeds. And this means that you get, um, nobody can sort of put in a message in between here or uh, look as if it's from this author because all of them are signed with the key that only the author has. So this is an event sourcing system uh, where feeds are these immutable chains of messages and has like an AK limit on the messages so you can store them locally. It has no global ledger consensus, so it's not like, um, it's not like uh, any kind of Bitcoin or, or something like that would actually uh, has these global properties in them. And you could do all of these messages that you saw before, you can either do them public or privately. And, and the interesting thing is that you can do any kind of message as a private message. So this, this would mean that you could, for example, when you follow someone, you can do that as a private message so nobody else can see that you're following that person, for example, or you block them. Uh, larger files are stored as, as blobs, there's five megabytes soft limit, and the really important part here is that only you store the pri your, your private key, so it's not on any other servers anywhere, it's only you. Another interesting uh, thing about the system is that because you have these signed and linked messages by hash, this means that uh, you have no URL where you can find the stuff. Everything is location transparent because the only thing you need to find a message is the hash of it. And then you talk to people and try to, to get the message. You do this by gossiping. So one of the ways, or like, like there's plenty of ways, of some of the things that are working is like local network. If you're in a local network, they would gossip between them. You can have pops, which are internet connected uh, machines like any other machine, which just relays messages between different ones. You can do onion hidden services who want to run over tour, or you can do sneak and it's like you can actually do your messages, put them on a USB stick and hand it to someone that also works. And the way it works with these feeds is that when you are the user here in the middle, uh, you start following people like in any kind of these systems. And that means that the people that you follow are inside this hub one that they're one hop away from you. And the way it normally works is that the clients are set up to have, to download messages from two hops away and then put them into your local view of the world. So this is all the messages that your machine contains. Uh, and what's interesting in this uh, kind of from uh, a data perspective is that you can have like uh, long running connections from your machine to a different machine and then you post like I'm interested in these feeds and then you can use these epi uh, epidemic broadcast trees which are quite efficient in actually pushing out updates so you can actually have somebody in the network assuming they are all connected posting messages and just actually just spreading out just as the as the message is posted and you could do this because you have this ordered locks uh, identity based secure messages. I'm just not going to go into very much detail here, but you can also block people, meaning that if you have uh, in the network here, you can see, let's say that you have these friends you connect to and this person is really annoying, so you can block them so they don't, they, they are not in your network. Or you can increase the hub, meaning that that person follows you not get unless you have someone else that can connect to those people. So that actually stops a lot of these attacks than you have on these kinds of systems. 
And this means that it's easier to, to guard against spam and harassment because you only pull in the messages that you're interested. The pops are, are also problematic if you follow them, but we have uh, peer invites rolling out very soon, which is going to make this really a lot better. And one of the other interesting uh, things in this system, which is not used very much, but is that um, every network here has a CAPS, and the CAPS is, is sort of like a key, uh, meaning that every message composed or um, written in this CAPS exists in one of these universes. And this means that you can choose a different CAPS, and then you have everything else working, all the clients, everything works, but you are in a different universe, and these universes don't interact with each other at all, and this means that you have the possibility to actually run like parallel systems. You could do like one locally, for example, for a system that you don't want anyone else to, to get access to, and even if you connect with these ones, if you don't know the caps, then you cannot get the messages or validate them. So if we look at the, the software side of this, there are different kinds, there are different implementations. There's one in JavaScript, one in Go, one on the way in Rust and C and Python as well. You have multiple interfaces that can interact with this data, which brings a nice kind of uh, diversity into the system. So you have like Patchwork, PatchBay, PatchFu. You also have mobile Android apps like Maniverse, for example. So it looks like this. It looks like any other kind of like system where you can see the, the, the posts over here. You can see the people you're connected to and you can see some of the people in the system as well. Um, and you can build apps on top of this. So for example, this is a, a book app and where you can see you put in the, uh, you put in the books and the way it works is like, like any kind of event sourcing system. So books are just uh, messages that you post with a specific type and then you can edit them in review uh, as anyone can do that and they just do this by actually posting messages and then you can correlate them and then actually uh, hydrate the state of these messages and that will be your book app. And because you only get data from your friends and friends of friends, that actually works pr pretty well. Uh, and f in general for these apps, you can do uh, more local filtering if you want to. Um, as I said, these blobs are like normally with the way we, we sort of push bigger data like images, for example, but there's also um, support for that, which is a super cool distributed system as, as well that you can use for, for these files. And, and one of the interesting things is that you can actually then starting playing around with actually getting uh, sort of uh, some of the community things in this. Like you can have like these pops, which are these long running nodes can actually start seeding these uh, files from your friends and this means that you actually have a system where you can exchange data which stays within your network and it actually helps the network, it actually grows by the number of nodes that are there. And this is another really interesting app that's built on top of this called Dark Crystal. So the idea is that you can have uh, a secret that you want to share with or that you want to say, for example, and then you can choose some of the some of the people that you trust the secret with, and the and the way it works is this: some your secret sharing, so you so you then send it, so you then send a shard to each of these person, and then you choose how many of these shards that you need for the quorum of this, and this means that you can put uh, secrets into the network that 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 you can then get back again, and these ones can then be from trusted friends that you know, for example, in the, in the real world. Um, you can run git on top of SSB, like you just really just do git init, add SSB create, and then you can see here you get like a repository which, which has a, a, the ID of this, and then it actually pushes these changes as blobs, so you can have like the whole system actually running and and you can just pull in updates as well, and it works exactly the same as any other kind of message that we've seen here. And what's the interesting things was that one of the Linux Foundation people came into the network about a month ago and wrote this article arguing that the Linux kernel should switch to sort of an SSB protocol because then you'd have the messages and the source code coexisting. Let's see what comes out of this, but it's really interesting to see these kinds of use cases from people. 
So, as you can see, this is like really very, very simple basic building blocks, and you can build all of these kinds of stuff on top of this. A lot of these things that I've shown are just things that people just build on top of these primitives. It's really fascinating. See, it's almost like a Lego from when you were kids. Some of the things that are being worked on is a new message format, uh, which is going to roll out soon, which is going to be a lot more efficient, has some really interesting properties. Private groups as well, so right now we have these private messages, but we also want to have larger private groups and can be a part of And This is not a trivial problem to solve, so we want to do this right. Another thing is, like, it could be interesting to have full peer running in browsers, like right now the JavaScript templates runs in Node, and you have these electron-based apps on top of this, but it could be really in interesting to have it like running this way. And another thing is that it could be one of the things that are worked on are these safer spaces like abuse audit um, moderation tools as well. Okay, so I'm going to do a small demo here uh, of one of the things that we're working on. And this is SSB in a browser. So uh, this is, uh, all of this is running in the browser. You can see it uses WASM for the crypto stuff. So. Um, um, and then it has, um, you can do blobs as well. And when you go into this, you actually auto generates an ID for you. And then, uh, just as a small demo, I built a, a system here where you can then um, actually start and in getting the, um, the messages. So I'm going to do an initial sync here. And the lovely artwork you can see here is actually built from one of the community members as well. And what it does now, it then it downloads all of these messages. So it actually downloads, uh, from the perspective of my profile, the latest 25 messages from, um, from, um, from the people that I'm connected to. And then it, uh, and then it starts getting these. So you can see or 145 feet more 4,000 messages, and it does everything here. It, does, it downloads the messages, looks at the private messages, because the way the private messages works is that there's no recipient on the private messages. So this means that when you, when you get a private message, you actually have to see if it's, if it's for you or not by actually trying to decrypt it. And then it gets these messages into this because I'm only interested in these posts, messages, and then uh, you have a system uh, where you can, let's see if this works, probably might need to. This is really um, very new. So you can see here you have the latest 10 messages and it replies and you can go into the, the profiles of people and see their messages as well. I have private messages working as well. So and this is, yeah, well, there's supposed to be messages in here. And uh, you can do private blobs as well in this. Um, so, uh, so this is pretty exciting, I think. <laughs> so, uh, so to sort of sum this up, this is I call it egalitarian software. So this this means that the people actually run the infrastructure themselves. The users are in control of the data, and they get these subjective data views on top of the data. Uh, that said, this is not a technical solution to any kind of social problem that you have out there. This is still, the social problem is, is really the hardest part of all of this, but I mean, at least you have like a level playing field where people can start experimenting with different um, solutions in this way. I'm going to change gear a bit as well. So this is a really fascinating book. If you haven't read it, you really owe yourself to read it. To read it. It's a relatively old book, but it's very, very good. It's one of the books that you read, and then it changes the way you think about things. Uh, what it talks about is this high modernism, which is a form of modernity, which is like, like this really unfaltered confidence in science and technology. And what's interesting is this point here, that it reorders the social and natural world for, for these things. Uh, it was very, uh, it had a sort of high in the 50s and 60s after the Second World War, and it's really characterized by a lot of centralization, even though it doesn't uh, look like it, uh, like it, and it's like, 
really um, rationalization of everything. Everything has to be rationalized. And the problem is that it goes into this kind of so rational that it all, almost like oversimplifies things and it has this tendency of, of having like the end justifies the means. So you see a lot of these kind of systems used, for example, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and also here, it's not necessarily in there. I mean, just look at the picture of, of this Chicago and people would actually look at the system and say, this is, oh, this is so beautiful. Look at all the straight lines here. Everything is ordered. It's really nice, especially from a plane when you're the, the planner of this city. And then when you look at these uh, old European cities, this is, this is really interesting when you look at them. You have like these small roads, like for example, this road here is probably because uh, you want to move stuff from here to here in a faster way and not go around this. So this is really an organic system and it's really interesting when you look at it this way. It actually looks like something from nature, not something built. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is that I think we have a lot of this digital high modernism. I mean, literally computers are like modernist wet dreams, like systems which are really stupid, just follows the rules that you do. It's really, really great that you can do like top-down approach to this because you have these systems that enforces really simple rules um, and you can see it in China for example with the social credit system but even in the US I mean if you go to a mall the people that have been analyzing uh, some of the uh, uh, billboards that they have there and they actually put in tiny cameras to analyze your face and look at your gender and the mood as well and use this to data mind you so it's not uh, I mean, only in these systems. And what you end up is this digital panopticon. And this image is from an, uh, a prison, actually, from 1925 that they built in the US. And what's interesting is that they built this tower in the middle, and then you have people looking out, and then you have all these cells here which are the prisoners. And what's interesting in this system is that the people in the cells, because they're open, then they don't know if they're watched or not, but they know that they might be watched, and alone that fact actually changes the way that they behave. So you end up this, with this system of global surveillance, like on the state level with the Chinese social credit system, for example, or even with the NSAs, as you can see Snowden has been shown as well. But it's very interesting that it's not only, and that's one of the points in the book, it's not only in these um, uh, state-run systems, it's actually also a lot in the capitalism, as you can see as well, because they are interested because they want this centralization of the global surveillance. So almost all the companies in the Silicon Valley does some kind of uh, thing like this. But there are ranges of lights in these systems, so like one of them is Barcelona, which is, has some really, really great stuff going on. And what's really interesting here is that they value this sovereignty, like technical sovereignty. And the way that they see this is that data is a public infrastructure. And more concretely, so Vodafone want, wanted to be their telecom provider. And they said that, okay, you can get that contract, but then you have to provide the data after you're done anonymously on this open data portal that we have. And this means that anyone then afterwards can go in and actually have a, a level playing field for actually doing the next kind of system. And what's interesting, of course, is that they resisted for over a year before they actually said, okay, we can do that. So, I just put this quote up here because it's really cool. I mean, if, and this is like from an early Chinese manual. This one is like several thousand years old, but it really shows very well uh, that they knew exactly uh, what was at stake here, even back then. So, to summarize, I've shown these different kinds of architecture, centralized, decentralized, and distributed, I have uh, shown different kinds of power models in these systems, hierarchical, <laughs> and I put in machine learning here as well, uh, and then egalitarian as well. And I talked a little bit about high modernism, and how it relates to all of these things, to put it into, sort of put it into a historical perspective. Okay, well, thank you.
Are there any questions? So um, this sounds like a really cool project that we are going to look a bit more into. Laura, OK. So uh, my question is, it sounds like uh, every user will have their own keys and their own identity and so on. Yes. Is there any built-in ways of handling anonymity and privacy? Uh, yeah, so uh, so the system is, um, so when you actually start uh, up as a user, you get your own key and you don't have to reveal anything about yourself. Uh, and then you can and then you can communicate with the other nodes as well. And often when you communicate, you for example leak information about yourself. Let's say that you you connect to a pub and then you have an IP address. This means that you leak information about where you are in the world. And we can and we can do uh, connections over 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 tour here, which means that you are you are actually um, uh, not revealing anything more that you want. Then you can then on top of this you can put in everything you want. You could do like pictures of yourself or names of yourself, but it's not like in Facebook where you're actually required to use your real name in order to use the system. You can have it uh, any way you want, so to speak. In any way you feel comfortable with. But what is actually interesting is that when I started using this system, I had like a normal profile. I didn't uh, post that much about myself. But actually, over time, there's a really, really great community here, and people really care about each other. And then you start uh, revealing more about yourself and sharing more stories just out of sharing with the people that you care for in the system. It's really interesting to see these dynamics in play, but you are open to do that when you want. Um, thank you for the, uh, the talk, that was, uh, that was great. Um, I, uh, I really like Scuttlebutt, but I also uh, have uh, some misgivings about uh, the way that I've seen it, like uh, by, by default it seems like it's actually not very privacy friendly at all, like it goes on the local area network and announces your uh, identity uh, when you install Patchwork, I don't know, this was like a year ago, uh, I don't know if that's still the case. Um, but then, like every pub you connect to, you tell it all the things that you want, uh, so that uh, you can get them if it has them. Um, but they they can identify you from that, right? So yes. Is it has it gotten any easier to use it in a uh, privacy uh, sort of conscious uh, fashion? Um, yeah. To, to not uh, just broadcast your identity uh, to your LAN and like a list of who you're following and. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, one of the things that Andrew has been working on is a new connection manager, which actually means that you have to, have to opt, in when, opt in when you connect to POPs, for example, or local area connections or Bluetooth, for example, so that once you run around with your phone and somebody else comes in, they can just not necessarily disconnect you. You have to actually authorize in order to exchange the data. But the other thing is that once you have this public data, it is public, and then it actually starts spreading around like gossip in, in the system. And the only good way to actually solve this is going to be with these private groups. And private groups are going to solve a lot of these uh, problems as well. Um, for the private groups, are you uh, thinking about having different feeds for the private communication? Because like when you put the private messages in your public feed, that gives you a nice sort of um, receiver uh, unobservability, it would seem like. Uh, but if two people are having a conversation, uh, like you can sort of infer that, uh, like since everybody sees it when you're sending. So um, like, uh, are, you, are you thinking about uh, having different feeds or still just one feed for everything? Well, it's sort of up to you. You can do whatever you like. If you want to communicate privately and not necessarily um, put these feeds, you can do a different feeds, but then you can still uh, try to correlate these things. What I would say about the system, which is interesting, is that it's very delayed tolerant. This means that you can post a message and then the next day or like another time actually exchange the message. You don't necessarily have to exchange the message right away, so you can add these delays, which makes it really hard to figure out who's necessarily communicating with each other. But that's a trade-off of anonymity towards, or 
right? and on the other side, like how fast you want the system to go. It's like traditional, any kind of anonymous system has these trade-offs. Any other questions? Yep. You uh, mentioned the Linux kernel thing um, using SSB for Linux yeah. kernel development. Do you know if anything has happened with that? Is anyone actually going to get that going? Uh, no, so I think that the message was posted on his blog as a way to sort of start the conversation. And <laughs> um, you could see that, that people were, were discussing about this by themselves, but as far as I know, uh, there hasn't come anything out of it. And, it, it. and if something comes out of it, I have a feeling that it's not necessarily going to be SSB, but something SSB-like, probably, but with the same ideas, I think. But, but it hasn't uh, happened anything like concrete with this. Any other questions? Okay, then let's have another round of applause for him. And thank you.